uh, folks. Uh, we'll give a few more minutes for people to join. Okay, um, we're close to 10 people and it's three minutes over. So I think we can get started. Um, <clears throat> we have one item on the agenda today, uh, but before that, just um, uh, Presto Conde is, is next, next, next Thursday, the 21st. Uh, so be sure to catch that. Um, and uh, after that, we'll leave it to Vivek. who will be talking about the early out uh, joins design um, and there will be some discussion around that. Um, and then uh, we can leave it, leave the floor open to any other questions or to topics that people would bring up. Okay, so uh, Vivek, would you like to take the floor? Sure, yeah. Um, honored to be the only item on the agenda today. And so. Um, can you guys see my screen? <laughs> yes, I see it. Okay. So what I was hoping to do here was to quickly run through the design that we have on a series of optimizer changes that we want to make to how semi-joins perform in Presto. Um, so quick problem statement here, right? I think um, uh, existential subqueries are a very common SQL construct, which take the form select something from table T uh, where some expression matches or exists in some subquery SQ, right? The idea here is that um, as long as there is at least one tuple from T um, or there's at least one match for a tuple from T in subquery, C, subquery SQ, then you want to output that tuple as a result of this operation. Right? So we call the sub subquery SQ the filtering source, and we call the table T the source, uh, the data source in this situation. So what we're going to go through here in this design is uh, valid for both in and exist queries, which take this form, and their counterparts not in and not exist. Um, so the way this SQL construct is processed in Presto today is that it's converted straight up into something called a semi-join operation. So a semi-join operation is where um, is a special kind of join where the inputs are not treated the same. The inputs from the right side of the join, right, which is the filtering source, you ignore all the duplicates on that side of the input, and then you try to perform a match with the input on the, on the left. 
so we call this a kind of early out join wherein we only care about one match for each input on the left uh, of the join and you kind of cop out or you uh, you you halt processing as soon as there is one one match so this is a very efficient operation as you can imagine in, uh, right a semi join is typically a very uh, efficient operation however you can imagine situations where this is not really optimal uh, so, uh, the obvious case is when your subquery SQ is very large. So now you wind up building um, a very large hash table out of the right input, right? And it can even go so far as to say that if the input in SQ is large enough that you cannot hold it in working memory, then presto DB today um, turns turtle, right? It doesn't, uh, it, it, you run out of memory and then you halt execution. So what we really want to do is to be able to try to convert these semi joins into a, into a form where the input to the join operation can be reordered, right? So join reordering in Presto today happens only with inner joins. So what we want to do is to convert these queries where um, where it will be optimal for join reordering to happen into a form where the, this can be done in in an inner, inner join operation. So in, in, in here, I go through a few situations where using some simple TPCH uh, queries, I can show that both performance and um, uh, the, whether or not the query can actually run is happening in Presto. So what we want to do here is try to see if we can uh, convert this set of queries into uh, a different uh, logical forms, which can then be run more efficiently, right? So in the previous example, I was showing you how you can actually convert the, one of these queries uh, into a logically equivalent form where the you know, where the join orders get flipped and then successfully executes while previously it ran out of memory and then failed. So the actual rewrite that we're talking about is uh, is one of these cases, right? So in, in case 3.1, I go through a canonical representation of the, in, uh, the existential query, right? Where I have a source A, a filtering source B, and then the in subquery is on matching on expression one and expression two, right? So we posit that this, this SQL construct is logically equivalent to what we have over here, right? Which is that for each, where I convert this into a inner join with a distinct or a final aggregation on top of the inner join. And the way we do it is by annotating each tuple from A with a unique ID Right, and then performing an inner join on subquery one and subquery two. Right, so what this now does is that it converts a one-to-one -one join <coughs> into a one-to-many join, where where the inner join now will match multiple uh, may produce multiple tuples for each tuple in SQ one. But however, each of these tuples is now annotated with the unique ID. And now, then we use the final aggregation on top of this inner join to actually squish it down back into, um, <coughs> into, one, uh, <clears throat> into a unique value for each tuple in SQ1. <clears throat> um, questions so far? Yeah, I do. Uh, are you saying then that B has a uh, very high cardinality so that a broadcast join is infeasible? Correct, yes. I'm saying when B is a, has a large, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's not even a broadcast join, right? Even if it is going to be a repartition join and B is pretty large, you still wind up with memory issues and performance issues, I mean, okay. memory pressure and performance issues. So what we are trying to do is to try to come up with a framework in which you can choose the best possible plan depending on um, the sizes of the relative sizes of the inputs to the to this operation. Okay, and have you seen what Drill did in terms of distributed broadcast join? 
to um, handle with with automated spills to handle out of memory type right so uh, actually i have not i would i would love to talk more about that but in general i think with presto right we what we try to do is we try to avoid spills as much as possible in the mm, in the sure. context of holding as much uh, data and memory so spill is going to spills is a i think it's a it's a separate it's, it's a tangential discussion to this whole thing spills should be avoided yes but the general strategy of <laughs> rearranging transforming to a join rearranging so that b is the smaller item and it is held in memory the larger item is scanned that prevents a spill as long as the smaller item fits in distributed memory that is correct yes that's that's the, that's the overarching um goal that we're trying to achieve but i don't think you need the distinct operation for that um let me go through the the different logical equivalences right i think you need some way of if you if you're going to convert it into an inner join where the semantics are different you need some way of eliminating duplicates out of the final result set you're right and uh but drill has uh a logical operator <coughs> which lets you filter against a distributed data set um and I'm, so you don't need to do the the distinct afterwards yeah i mean I, i'm not sure about drill i would love to get more information about that from you um but i don't really know how that works or how that will fit into this yeah into presto but, but but basically the strategy that they took which is applicable here is they extended a lot set of logical operators mm -hmm. rather than purely depending on query transformation. Okay. Uh, ex what does that mean, extending logical operators? So that the, the, the set of logical operators that are at the low level dis distributed exchanges and things like that mm -hmm. uh, was extended with a distributed filter operation, I believe. Okay. So that that original form, if A is larger than B anyway, and if B fits into memory, then it, it literally implemented the first form. Okay. And, and would just stream a, uh, each reader of A would read a, a, a record and then throw that record at the correct element that contained the corresponding or could contain the corresponding pieces of B. Okay. Okay, uh, that sounds very interesting. I would love to follow up. Uh, if you have more information to share on that one, I would love to, um, or just feel free to add it to this. I, I don't have the specifics. I was a spectator on that work. Okay, okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. Uh, I'll, I'll try to see if I can follow up. And or just it. pop Ted. into the join, the drill Slack, and they're very friendly people. Ted, the, what you're referring to is, um, Dynamic filtering, if I'm not mistaken, or, or did I Sounds get that wrong? Sounds pretty right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we already do dynamic filtering for broadcast joins. Um, I, I think like we just don't do it for um, uh, for for non-broadcast joins. Um, so uh, broadcast joins on um, uh, bucketed tables, actually. So, but, but a broadcast join would be where B is replicated on many nodes, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and so I'm just talking about the case where B is partitioned instead. Yeah, so that's that's the more general broadcast, um, sorry, uh, dynamic filtering uh, functionality, which uh, we, we don't support right now. Yeah. But um, I think that's that's a, a point that's well taken. Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, no, that makes sense, right? I think the, uh, I think, okay, well, I think, uh, we we currently only support dynamic filtering where the fragment uh, uh, where the operators are within the same fragment boundary, right? So which kind of uh, is only for broadcast joins. Uh, but I think uh, <coughs> and I think there is some something to be said about how the cardinality <coughs> and performance could be could benefit from implementing dynamic filters across exchange boundaries 
<clears throat> but um, it's it's still a little it's still not guaranteed, right? So what if you wind up? Uh, so those are those are runtime optimizations that you make in order to make the uh, performance better in uh, introducing the input to the join itself. But but if it, if if it, if it turns out that your dynamic filtering is not as effective as you would have thought it as you would have wanted it to be or thought expected it to be, then you still wind up with the same situation where your write input does not fit in memory. <coughs> does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> right. So. Okay, so so from that perspective, right? I think we're going to try to work with the optimization framework in trying to come up with a better plan, which may or may not be uh, helped or uh, aided by the dynamic filtering, which will happen later. Uh, okay, so the first three that we just went through is where we convert the semi join into an inner join with a distinct on after the join. The second logically logically equivalent uh, rewrite is one where the you perform the distinct or the aggregation on the input B before the join itself, right? So now when you do the inner join, you're guaranteed that there is only unique values for expression two in subquery two, and therefore every single pupil can match with at most one pupil in subquery two, right? Which is kind of the semantics of the semi join again. And the third uh, equivalent, right? This is not really a SQL standard implement uh, representation, but this is what Presto does today, which is it uses a, set, a special operator called the semi join operator to perform this operation here. So, <clears throat> so what we want to see here is how do we gracefully transform between these three different uh, plans, right? Or if you will, for for the situation. So uh, th this kind of depends on the relative sizes of B and A, right? So the first case is where B is smaller than A, in which case we kind of always want to go with the, what we call the left early out join, right? Where the, where, which is which is what Presto does today, which is implemented in the form of a semi join. <clears throat> the case two is when B is larger than A, then we want Presto's cost-based optimizer to step in and uh, pick the right join order. And in order for us to do that, we have to convert this into a, one of the rewrites involving an inner join, right? And which of these two rewrites is better and when is the next question, right? So 3.1 versus 3.2, where 3.1 is where you perform the distinct after the join, and 3.2 is where you perform the distinct before the join. <clears throat> so remember in both these cases, now you flip the join order and B is, on, is the left input to the join. So if, now that you converted this to an inner join, right? Now it is possible that the size of the intermediate result set of the inner join is actually pretty large because now the, remember this is a one to n join. So if you have uh, a large intermediate result set which is being produced as a result of the inner join, then the final distinct on top of the inner join may have a lot of work to do. And the large intermediate result set also produces, induces memory pressure on the system. <clears throat> so if, if you wind up in a situation where the inner join produces a large intermediate result set, it's possible that you wind up wanting to perform the distinct aggregation before the inner join in order to reduce duplicate matches, right? Uh, but on the other hand, if your join itself is cardinality reducing, that is, there's only very few tuples that match and your join is actually acting as a very powerful filter for you, then you're probably better off uh, incurring uh, you, you're probably better off postponing the aggregation to after the join where you have much less data to work with for correctness, right? So this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the three main situations where we're trying to deal, uh, we're, we're trying to handle here, which is that if B is smaller then we go with the existing semi-join framework. And then we switch between rewrite 3.1 and 3.2, depending on whether the inner join is a cardinality reducing join or not. But regardless, I think the main thing here is that what Presto does today is that it, it does a very simple logical transformation, which goes straight away to um, rewrite 3.3 here, right? But we argue that 
this needs to be a cost-based decision, which kind of uh, switches between these three re rewrites as necessary. Uh, so the way we will implement this is through a series of optimi optimizer rules. Uh, the first rule will come, will come in and say, hey, I'm going to convert this um, in subquery, existential subquery, into rewrite 3.1, right? which is the distinct uh, after the join. And then we have the Presto CBO come in and then look at the join and then reorder if necessary, right? And then if the join has not been reordered, as in where the uh, where B is still the right input to the inner join, then we go back and we rewrite it out to the semi-join format that, uh, uh, that, that Presto does today. But if the join has actually been reordered by the cost-based optimizer, then we need to decide on whether we want to choose between 3.1 or whether we want to continue with 3.1 or whether we want to convert it to 3.2 based on the, uh, the cardinality reducing characteristics of the inner join. So this is kind of the uh, overall workflow that we have in mind for this set of rewrites. Um, let me pause there. Vivek, <clears throat> I have one question, Vivek. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Jim Apple from Meta. Um, so anytime you do a rewrite like this where you're depending on the CBO to change your, potentially change your join order, mm -hmm. there are gonna be um, databases uh, and tables where you don't have statistics or you have bad statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you break queries um, because now something that was completing sort of accidentally because of the way that Presto does the semi-join will get reordered by the CBO optimistically um, and then start breaking because we're going to run out of memory. Um, right. Is this something that you've tested out to see what the footprint is here, what the blast radius is? Uh, <clears throat> we've tested it out and benchmarked the common uh, data sets, right? The benchmark data sets, uh, TPCDS, TPCH, and so on. But you're right. I mean, this, this is kind of a stepping back, right? This is a philosophical problem where any kind of work you do to an existing optimizer is something that may affect certain workloads, uh, which, you, which you didn't anticipate, right? And so how do you guard against something like that? Uh, there, are, there are some... The, the traditional way of doing this in database systems is to have some kind of a way of storing old plans for queries, right? So, or a way of uh, switching between optimizer <clears throat> um, versions and things like that, right? And now I think uh, with Presto, what the, what we, the way we operate is that we kind of hide all of these features or we control all of these features with various feature flags and, uh, uh, you turn them on and off as necessary for sessions for the whole system and so on. So I don't think I have a very good answer to you with respect uh, for for exactly how to mitigate potential fallout of any any optimizer work. Okay, got it. Thank you. So in my experience, these optimizations can be <clears throat> mega impactful. They can really, really help. But <laughs> the problem comes down to bad estimations on cardinality, right. which is a notoriously difficult problem unless you get some sort of empirical evidence. And the, oh, we'll do it someday strategy for that in drill was always, oh, let's just start running it and monitor whether or not the uh, assumptions were correct. If they're wrong, we'll abort the query and rerun it with uh, cached statistics on sub-expressions. Right. And I, mean, I think uh, the at the TSC a month back, there was a project where we were talking about using historical runs, uh, statistics estimated in previous runs to make subsequent runs better. So that's that's certainly something that is an overarching project which will kind of uh, influence and permeate, 
permeate <clears throat> most other planning in the optimizer if done right. And I had very good feedback from users when I asked them, when, when we talked about caching like that, and I asked them, would you be willing to run parts of your query ahead of time just to teach the optimizer what the reality of the situations are? And, and users mm -hmm. were thrilled about that. They said, fine, we could run that every day if, if it would help. Yeah, no, I think the concept of a, an optimizer that learns from its past performance is, has always been a very, um, it's, it's been a, it's, it's a holy grail, right? We've always, we've, we've, many people have tried to work on exactly, on implementing something like that, but what it actually takes to do that is, um, we, we get that in small steps, I think. Cool. If you could get think, that, that would really kill a lot of devilish situations. No, yeah, I think I, I, I don't know if you if you um, if you if you were there for last month's meeting, but I think no, I the, the folks at Meta are working on something like that. I thought they're putting together the building blocks for something like that. And yeah, it's 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 exciting. Well, that's it from me. Thank you, folks, for listening. Um, any more questions? I can. I'm happy to talk, or we can interact more on this GitHub issue itself. Yeah, and even if you get a poor caching algorithm, if you just restart the query, the query optimizer probably will have learned its mistakes. Right. Yeah, the cardinality estimation is a tricky problem. I agree. Right. I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not saying it's not a tricky problem, but all. But I think. For, for the purposes of this work here, I think that is a tangential question. But if you ran that query twice in a short time span, the cardinality estimation becomes much easier because the mistakes become clear. And if you cache anything, the cache will be hot. Agreed, yes. Cool. Um, yeah, I was thinking like in, in the meantime, um, um, it might make sense, you know, just to sort of like, um, you know, basically do this in phases where the, the first phase is, is opt in and then the second phase is, is opt out and, um, like in lieu of historical estimates, improving, uh, the optimizer's decision-making, um, this at least gives people, you know, um, advance notice and time to prepare. That's true, right? I think the, in general, the way we've been doing is we, uh, it's always opt-in uh, for any new feature, optimizer or otherwise in Presto, right? And then over time, we kind of, um, <clears throat> once things are a little more battle tested, we turn it on and switch the flip the default. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, but um, just making it so that when we flip it on, you know, like, you know, like there's like a, an announcement section in the release notes, like that definitely seems like a announcement worthy thing where, you know, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like there's, um, there's been adequate time and, you know, if you haven't prepared, like you can keep it disabled, but there's something you as the Presto operator needs to do to, uh, to make this safe if you haven't prepared yourself for this. Right. Yeah, that is, that is a good point where we should do that. I'll, I'll make a note of that. Um, great, thanks Vivek. Um, if that was, that was um, all we had on the agenda today, I um, wanted to leave the floor open to see if there's any, anything else anyone wanted to bring up or discuss. Um, it sounds like, um, there's nothing else, so we can end the call early. Thanks everyone.